Hi everyone, I'm Chef Susie from Escoffier Online, and our segment today is going to be about understanding sanitizing in the kitchen. But before we start on our segment, we're going to be doing something fun. We have the uh, live drawing today for the iPad Mini, and I'm going to be announcing the Chef Jacket winners as well. And I have Chef Cesar here, and he's going to pick the mini, the winning name for the iPad Mini. Chef Cesar is um, one of the mentors here at Escoffier Online. If you don't know him, he helps out a lot of the culinary students as well as bacon and pastry. So thanks for coming today, oh, Chef, Chef Cesar. Susan. So we've got the names in our pot here. And I wanted to say what a great job everyone did on their assignments. And um, we had assignments just flowing in like crazy. So congratulations, everyone who did a great job. Doing your assignments brings you closer to graduation. It's the year of the graduate. That's why we're celebrating with these raffles and contests almost every month. And keep in mind, we had a really nice graduation ceremony set up here at the school on Saturday. It's still running this week. If you want to check it out at graduation.escoffieronline.com. And we're going to be having another ceremony for all of you who haven't graduated yet in about six months. So continue with your good work and your assignments so you can participate in the next graduation ceremony. So Chef Cesar is going to go ahead and pick the name for the iPad Mini. I've got it right here. It's a super nice little black one, and you're going to love it. Super handy with your assignments. Well, good morning, everyone. Before I go ahead and start, pick the winner for this month, I want to thank you all of you for all the hard work. As you can see, we have over 1,500 pieces of paper here. This uh, represents one assignment from, from many different people. Some have more than one, but again, a lot of work from you guys, and uh, thank you for keeping myself and Chef Susie busy grading your assignments. So now I'm going to go ahead and pick this. I don't want to suspend you no more. So let's go ahead and pick the winner for this month, okay? Chef Susie, I'm going to stick my hand in here, as you can see. Shake them up. And you can read the name. Okay. And the winner for the iPad Mini for the month of July contest is Elaine Garraway. Congratulations, Congratulations Elaine. Elaine. We'll be sending the iPad Mini off to you in New York City. All right. Well, thank you, Chef. Thank and go ahead with your show. Thank you thank for you. joining us, Chef Cesar. Okay, so that was exciting. We've got our iPad Mini going out to Elaine today. And now I wanted to announce some winners for the Chef Jacket, the Escoffier branded Chef Jacket, which we're going to be embroidering your name on the jacket. So I have three winners here today, and these are the students who submitted the most assignments in the month of July. And our first winner is Natalie Ferguson. Congratulations, Natalie. We'll be sending out the jacket to you. Student Services will have a form for you to fill out to get your size and the correct spelling of your name. Our next winner is Alice Dean Esposito. Congratulations, Alice. We'll be sending that jacket out to you as soon as we get all the specifics from you of how you want it ordered according to size and your name embroidered on the jacket. And our third and final winner is Richard Burton. And congratulations, Richard. We'll be sending your jacket out to you as well. Just let student services know when they send you the form, what size, and how you would like your name spelled on your jacket. So now you're going to be branded with the Sagafier logo, and you'll be able to wear your jacket either at home during your assignments or when you get a job in the workplace or if you're in the workplace right now. So congratulations to everyone on all your good work. And like Chef Cesar said, he kept us super busy grading assignments, which is a really good thing. We enjoyed it. We always love seeing your great, yummy, delicious work. So knowing that, let's get started on our segment today. We're going to be talking about sanitation today, and we've been having a lot of fun in the kitchen with our recipes, but now we're going to be just a little bit more serious. And sanitation is so important in the kitchen because safety comes first. So sanitation really starts with our personal hygiene. When you come to work or when you're cooking in your kitchen, you're going to always want to be clean and um, have your like nails well trimmed, not wearing any nail polish or jewelry and you're gonna to wanna to wear a clean uniform, pull your hair back, and um, you're gonna be practicing washing your hands constantly throughout your work 
and um, through your day, especially when you're in a commercial kitchen. And you're going to be wearing gloves a lot, especially when you're in a commercial kitchen, so when you're handling things. So get used to that. And I wanted to mention that our state and our, um, our local, our state, and our national health departments, they regulate sanitation in the commercial kitchens. So when you're in home, at home, we've been suggesting that you're using a vinegar and water solution for your sanitizing because we're not sure of what kind of surfaces you have at home and what's safe at home. So the vinegar and water solution is a nice safe solution to use at home and it's safe for kids and pets too. But when you get into a commercial kitchen, it's a completely different story. You won't be using your vinegar and water solution. So I wanted to make sure that you know about all of this. So like I said, our local, our county, our state, and our national health departments, they help regulate this. And in commercial kitchens, you will um, be following their guidelines. And you can take classes through a company. Um, a really popular company is named Servisafe. And you can take classes, and then you can gain your certification. And the classes are usually about two days long. And there's a lot of information, and we won't be covering everything today. I mean, there's full books on sanitation, and there's full classes. So we're just going to touch on it a little bit, get your feet wet a little bit. But when you're in a commercial kitchen, you're most likely going to be taking these classes and gaining your certification. Super interesting stuff. And like I said, these are guidelines by our, um, our health department. And you also have inspections in your commercial kitchen from the local health department. The inspector comes in and checks to make sure that you're following the, um, the rules, the regulations, and um, pretty much the laws. So keep all of that in mind. So let's get started. We're going to touch base a little bit on sanitation and give you a little bit of a foundation. If you feel like you have any questions on this or if you need any guidance, I can also help you find where you can take classes in your area. I know that um, they're usually about 16 hours and then you take your test and you gain your certificate and they are available online as well. So if you need help with that, please let me know. We have a question. Where can we order the book? Where can, the question is where can you order the book? There are a lot of books on sanitation. But when you actually take the class, you're going to get a book and usually a workbook and that's going to help guide you through the class. And um, then you'll be taking your test. And if you pass your test, then you'll be getting your certificate. And then you'll be licensed in your state or county according to their guidelines. So if you have any questions or need any help or any guidance with that, be sure to contact me. You can reach me at 877-452-5489 or on the BP Mentors email. I'd be happy to help you with that and help you, to help you find something in your area and better explain the class what I know about it as well. So back to our sanitation. So sanitation is important not only through your personal hygiene, but you're going to be sanitizing your work surfaces and your equipment and your utensils. And some of the common sanitizing solutions that you're going to be using for your work surfaces and your equipment, you can use a solution of bleach and water, which I have here. I did check on. Um, the Clorox website and um, because I use Clorox, ble Clorox bleach today and they recommend a 3% solution and that would be one half cup of bleach to one gallon of water. So you're going to be using this on your work surfaces as well as your equipment like your mixer and things that you can't you know put in the sink and wash or put in the dishwasher especially in the commercial kitchen in larger um, larger mixers, some of them stand on the floor. So you're going to want to first wash, then rinse, and then sanitize. It's a basic procedure. So let's say, for example, you've got your mixer and you're making some yellow cake and you have some splatted on there. You're going to want to like wash it off really good with a little bit of soap and water, rinse it, then go over it with your sanitizer. So keep that in mind. Not only do you have the bleach solutions that you can use, you can use something that's called a quaternary ammonia solution, and that's typically available commercially. And you, a lot of times in the kitchen, you'll have a company that's selling you your soap products, and they'll, they'll also offer you um, different solutions. They'll sell you bleach as well, and they'll also offer you this quaternary ammonia, which you um, 
but you make a solution just as you do with the bleach and uh, they're also known as quats in the kitchen and um, they have a little bit of an odor to them it's a little bit different than bleach and not as strong so you're going to use this for your surfaces and your equipment just like you would use your bleach now when it comes to utensils that's a little bit different a lot of times you're going to be washing your utensils in a commercial kitchen in a three compartment sink and you're going to follow the same rule. You're going to wash, rinse, and sanitize. You're going to have the first compartment is for washing, but you're going to want to get all of your debris off these dishes before you put them in that sink. Then the middle compartment is for rinsing, and then the third compartment is for sanitizing. So in the sanitizing compartment, you can also use the bleach and water solution, the quat solution that I explained to you, and you can even use hot water, but it's got to be up to 170 degrees and the tools, cutting boards, small wares, they have to sit in there for about 30 seconds. And a lot of times you'll see pot washers in the kitchen wearing big plastic gloves. They come like up to here and they're, um, they're thicker and that's to like, you know, help their hands and protect them because they're in these waters and solutions all day and you know how your fingers kind of get pruney. And those gloves are also gonna help when you're getting these dishes out of this hot water. And it's the same thing that your dishwasher is doing at home if it has a sanitizing setting on it, sanitizing your tools and your dishes. So does anyone have any questions so far? We have a question. Will the bleach spot your clothes at that strength? The question is, is will the bleach spot your clothes at this strength? I think it will on something dark, so be careful. And also be mindful, bleach has a tendency to yellow plastic products, that's why in the beginning, in your coursework, we suggested that you use a vinegar and water solution because we're not sure if your surface is at home. So make sure you check before you use something like bleach and water on your surfaces at home. I know I had someone at my house use um, bleach, like a strong bleach solution, when they were cleaning my white microwave, and the door like had it started to yellow over time. So bleach has tendency to yellow white plastic. So be careful with it. And um, if you're not sure, stick with your vinegar and water solution at home. But it's important that you know about these other solutions and guidelines in commercial kitchens. Some of you are doing this, you're just going to be working at home. And some of you are going to be going into a commercial kitchen. Some of you also are going to be doing some baking at home through what we call in Illinois the cottage license and that's also regulated by your local health department. And this is so you can do some baking and make some simple things to sell at local farm, farmers markets. So when you get your cottage license or you contact your local health department, they'll let you know of the guidelines that you need to use at home if there are any for your state. And this varies from state to state and for sure from country to country. So keep all of this in mind and remember always safety comes first. Don't ever jeopardize safety when you're making food. Don't make a shortcut that's going to jeopardize any safety at all. So back to our sanitation. So the purpose of sanitizing our surfaces, our tools, and um, our equipment, our utensils, and keeping ourselves clean too is so we don't um, have an overgrowth of bacteria and also so we're not moving it around and cross-contaminating things in the kitchen. So bacteria, something that loves to grow. It needs food to grow. And the perfect food for bacteria is high protein foods such as the meat and eggs. And the eggs are something that are like a staple in the pastry kitchen. So you're gonna wanna know how to handle your eggs properly. So the bacteria loves the protein in these items. And these are typically called, called excuse me, called hazardous foods. So be careful with your hazardous foods that you're handling these properly. Always be really careful when you have eggs out that you're not cross-contaminating them with something that is already cooked. That's a big no-no. So watch out for these high protein hazardous foods that bacteria love to grow in. And bacteria also need um, moisture such as water to grow. They need the perfect temperature and they love temperatures that are in between 41 and 135. Once you get to 133, 135, it starts to kill the bacteria. So they're thriving in between 41 and 135, and that's considered the temperature danger zone. So you wanna keep your 
high protein foods in your dairies and things like that out of this temperature danger zone as much as you can. If it means um, when you're receiving things on a hot day, getting them in the refrigerator quickly or not keeping food on your work surface as long, keep in mind this temperature danger zone. So this 41 degrees Fahrenheit that I'm talking about is a temperature that you do not want your refrigerator to go any higher than. Your refrigerator has to be lower than 41. It's typically in between 33 and 41. I always like to set my refrigerator temperatures in between 34 and 36. I try to keep them away from that 40 zone as much as I can, especially if they're a reach-in or a walk-in in a warm kitchen where you have a large oven running all day every time you're in that door the warm air is going in. So I keep mine always set a little bit cooler and I definitely monitor that temperature throughout the day and especially before you go home you're going to want to keep logs and also with your refrigerator at home this is super important keep a thermometer in your refrigerator. I always keep two in mind because thermometers you never know they could be different. So it just makes me feel a lot better. I keep them in different areas of the refrigerator. So keep your refrigerator at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. That's super important. It's going up to 45. That bacteria, whatever bacteria is in your food, is just going to start growing. And you may kill the bacteria when you start cooking things, but you don't want that thriving in your food because it releases toxins that aren't killed when you're cooking. So you want to keep your bacteria growth to a minimum by using proper sanitation and handling your foods. Also, bacteria, they love their environment to be a neutral environment, not too acidity and not too alkali. So keep that in mind too. So we want to, we're going to be controlling any bacteria that's in our food through cooking and sanitizing. So does anyone have any questions so far? We have a question. For the vinegar and water, what is the ratio of vinegar to water? For the vinegar and water solution, the ratio that we usually use typically is 50-50, half um, vinegar and water and half, I mean half vinegar and half water. And a lot of times at home, I'll just use almost straight vinegar as well. So if you've got kids and pets, it's super safe to use. I use it at home for a lot of things. Like you can even use it for like, cleaning your windows and mirrors and then you don't have to worry about if you're spraying with it, you know, your puppy or your little kid. So it's safe at home. But like I said, when you're in a commercial kitchen, you have guidelines by your state, local health departments. You've got to follow these. These are the laws. So your little vinegar solution is not going to work in a commercial kitchen. And also in commercial kitchens, you have different surfaces. You have stainless steel tables and it's not going to hurt that table if you're washing it down with some bleach or some quat solution. So your equipment is a lot different at home. So these are some things to consider too. Some of your home surfaces are just not cut out for using bleach or quats on them. So back to our sanitation. So one of the key things in a kitchen where you can spread any type of bacteria is through cross-contamination and this is why you want to keep your surfaces and your hands and all of your utensils clean. If you have a utensil that has some debris on it and then you go and use it on another food, you're just around. So this is why you want everything to be clean. And a really good example of a cross-contamination is if you come into sick, into work one day and you have the flu, and you should really stay home if you're sick, because you can really just spread your germs around to the kitchen, the food, to everyone. So let's say you're not feeling well and you're sneezing and you're working in the kitchen and you're really busy and you have this whole pile of maybe like some strawberries or some oranges that need to be cut for your cakes and your displays that you're making. So you sneeze, you sneeze into your hand and you're in a hurry and you don't wash your hands and you go right back to your fruits and vegetables. This is cross-contamination. You're transmitting all of the germs on your hands onto your fruits. So this is a big no-no. If you're sneezing, wiping your nose, wiping your face, anything in the kitchen, make sure that you're washing your hands really well with soap and water and then drying them as well. And it's good to keep a nail brush by the sink as well in case you get some chocolate or anything like under your nails so you can get cleaned up really well. 
And another example of cross-contamination, I'm going to give a savory example, is um, with chicken, which is another hazardous food because it's a protein food. And let's say that you've got some cooked chicken in, on your workstation, you're working on it, you're cutting it up, maybe you're making some chicken salad, and you realize at the last minute you don't have enough chicken, so you've got to pull out some more raw chicken and cook some more. So you pull out the raw chicken, you put it on your cutting board, you throw it in the pan, you're cooking it behind you, and then you continue to work on your cooked chicken, chicken salad, with this chicken that you had on your hands and on your table. So you're contaminating the cooked product with the raw product, which is known as cross-contamination. So those are a few examples, but honestly, if you have any questions, if you need me to clear anything up, I know this can be a lot if you're hearing it for the first time, but it's really important, so please call me or send me an email with any questions that you have. No question is too big or too small. So this is super important stuff, this cleanliness and cross-contamination. Cross-contamination can also happen in a kitchen. This can happen in a commercial kitchen or in your home kitchen. Let's say in the refrigerator. In larger kitchens, you'll be keeping a lot of things separate, like uh, seafood will be in one refrigerator, meats will be in another, poultry, vegetables, fruits, and then your baked goods. But in smaller kitchens, there's gonna be sharing like there is at home. So you're always going to want to start at the top and put your, um, your cooked and prepared foods at the top, your foods that aren't gonna be cooked at all, and then your raw foods in the bottom. Cause you can have, anything can happen. There can be some dripping. It doesn't even have to be the pan itself dripping. Let's say that you have some fish in a pan, you've got some ice in there and there's a little bit of water. You've got it covered in plastic, but you kind of swung around with it. And um, some of that like water kind of splashed up on the lip of the plastic. Then you put it like over your chocolate cake and it's dripping out of the corner and dripping on the cake. This can happen so easy. It doesn't have to be a hole in the pan. Something like that can happen easily. So keep your cooked items above your raw items, especially those hazardous foods. So like I said, it's a lot of information, but if you have any questions, be sure to let me know. So I wanted to talk about the HACCP system, which you're going to be finding in commercial kitchens as well. And the HACCP system is an acronym, H-A-C-C-P, and it stands for Hazardous Analysis and Critical Control Systems. And this is analyzing, it's really, it's, it's a big word, it sounds complicated, but you're really just analyzing your food flow through your kitchen from the moment it comes in to the moment it's stored to the moment that it's um, served. And you wanna make sure that all the procedures are followed properly and that this food is handled in the best way that it can. So your food comes in through the door and what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to store it properly. If it's a hot day, even if you're busy, get you know your milk and eggs, your dairy, your cream, your meats, get all of those in the refrigerator first and then put away your dry goods. And it's important that you're storing these, like I said, with the um, raw foods far away from the cooked and prepared foods. So part of the HACCP system is following this food flow through the kitchen. So then you're gonna assess any hazards. Like, did I handle that properly? Did I put it away properly? Make sure that you make some corrections if it wasn't. And you're gonna identify these critical control points. Like if it's um, the food coming in, being stored in the purchasing or storage area, or if it's the food being moved to the kitchen. Any critical control point where something may have gone wrong the food may have been in the temperature danger zone for too long, make sure that you take corrective action on these critical control points. And you're gonna be setting standards along the way and you're gonna be following the standards. And every operation is a little bit different. So when you get a system in place, it'll work just fine, but it's just a matter of getting the system in place and identifying that the food is stored, cooked, and served properly. For, because you want your customers to remain healthy and then they're gonna come back to your establishment, whether it's a restaurant, a bakery, or a cafe. So you're gonna also monitor the system to make sure everything is handled and stored and served properly and make any corrective actions. And then you're gonna be making your, you're gonna be doing some recording and making your own sheets for, that are gonna work for your establishment. Just one example 
of a form or sheet that you're going to be making is monitoring the temperature on your refrigerator. You should have certain times of day set that the temperature is monitored, it's recorded, and it's um, initialed or signed by the person that recorded it. Because refrigerators break all the time in commercial kitchens, so you want to catch that as soon as you can so you can move everything out of that refrigerator before it gets higher than 41 degrees Fahrenheit because then you're going into the temperature danger zone. So that's a really good example of a form and that you're going to be making for your establishment. You're going to be checking that refrigerator temperature from the, the minute you walk in the door. It's one of the first things that you're going to do. And then you're going to have timelines throughout the day where it's checked. And it's also going to be checked before you're going home. Sometimes in larger establishments such as hotels, there will be a security or engineering staff on hand. And sometimes they're going to be checking your refrigerator temperatures while you're at home sleeping at maybe two or three in the morning from one of their checklists as well. So that's just something that's super important, it, watching that refrigerator temperature because you're storing a lot of things in there, especially high protein things where bacteria love to thrive. It's great food for them. So let's touch base a little bit on, so we've talked about the HACCP system and the solutions and how our bacteria grows. Let's talk a little bit about cooking eggs, which is a considered a hazardous material, and it's something that's used a lot in the pastry kitchen. So you're going to be cooking your eggs to 145 degrees, and you're going to be cooking them for about 15 seconds. So if you're making something, let's just say, for example, the pastry cream in your assignment that's got whole eggs in it, and the egg yolk is considered the dangerous part of the egg, and that's where salmonella is sometimes found. So when you're cooking your pastry cream, you're going to want to bring it to a boil, and it's going to be 145 degrees, and you're going to want it at that temperature for about 15 minutes. If you're ever, cook if you're ever cooking eggs or custard or anything like that, and you're unsure with your pastry cream, just take the temperature with a thermometer. A digital thermometer works really well, or even a stem thermometer. And then you'll know that you're cooking your eggs properly, and your food is going to be served in the very safest form. So does anyone have any questions on sanitizing solutions, how to do it, why you do it? We have another question. How do you properly dry your equipment, and do you know of an alarm for home use of the temperature drop? The question is, is how do you properly dry your equipment? Once you put this sanitizing solution on your surfaces, you leave it air dry. It works on its own and it's going to air dry on its own. You don't want to like slop it on there, a lot of it. You just have a wet cloth, so it's going to dry just fine. Your utensils, when you pull them out of the three compartment sink and third compartment, remember your wash, rinsing, and sanitizing, you're going to want to um, just put them off to the side. There's always a drying area, and then they're going to air dry. And we had another question if I know if there is an alarm for a refrigerator if the temperature drops. I'm not aware of them, but there could be something out there. But please, if you find one, let me know. I'd really like to get one myself. I think that would be something that would be really great to have to notify you and alert you that your temperature has dropped. And that would help if you're manually checking things like every four hours, depending on how you have it set up. So keep an eye on your refrigerator at home as well, especially if you're using a lot in the hot day. So if there's no questions, we're going to say goodbye today. And once again, congratulations to everyone. You did a super job on the assignments. I mean, so many were coming in. Cesar and I were so busy. We absolutely loved it. Like I said, we love seeing your work, and we're super happy for you that you're making such graduation, our next graduation. But if you have a chance to view the site that's up right now, it's really nice, and uh, you can make a little applause for your fellow students and graduates. So we'll see you next time. And like I said, if you have any questions on sanitation, it's a lot. I can clear it up for you. I'd love to help. And have a great day, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.